Thank you very much, Mareike. Well, thank you for coming on this cold April morning. I hope it will be warm again soon. So this is lecture five, and I have, all right, so why is this not working? Okay, there we go. So this is lecture five, and um, the last two lectures at least have been very theoretical, and then rather than giving you more theory, I thought it was time to look at some applications, and then in the next lecture in two weeks, uh, I will have more information about the theory. Oh yeah, the sound is off, right? Do I need to turn something on here, maybe? That one's fine. Is this, do I need, do I need a microphone? No, Jan in the back, do I need a microphone? No, okay, good. So then I will not turn this microphone on. All right, so, uh, so today I will show more applications and then there will be a little bit more formalism in two weeks. Um, I have packed in a lot of information in these slides and if I don't get through everything, then that's all right, then we'll just stop and I will um, continue at the next lecture. So two weeks ago, we talked about, or three weeks ago, uh, we talked about the Drude model for free carriers and the Lorentz model for bound carriers. So the applications is that we use the Drude model for metals and for doped semiconductors and we use the uh, Lorentz model for insulators and then of course we may have to combine both models if a system has both free and bound electrons. Uh, and there are several <coughs> approximations. Oops, that was not good. Where is my, okay, this is my pointer. So there are several approximations. There is something which is called the Selmayr equations and poles and Cauchy. So I will talk about these approximations of the Lorentz model and their <coughs> benefits and limitations. Um, most of the examples that I'm showing today will be from Mark Fox, Optical Properties of Solids. And then uh, I have some original work from um, my, my own group. And then of course there's also the Handbook of Ellipsometry and the book on Ellipsometry by Fujiwara. And um, you also find uh, standard texts on electricity and magnetism useful for the formalism, maybe not so much for the examples. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to uh, address a question that was asked in the last lecture. So in the last lecture, I talked about generalized plane waves. And this term, generalized plane waves, is taken from this book by Mansuripur on magneto-optical recording. And an inhomogeneous plane wave, uh, the, the term inhomogeneous plane wave is much more common than the term generalized plane wave. Uh, and uh, so Mansuripur calls them generalized plane waves, but if you look in Jackson uh, or in other textbooks on um, electricity and magnetism, then you will find the term inhomogeneous plane waves. So I've changed the title of the slide to inhomogeneous plane waves. Um, a plane wave is not a solution to Maxwell's equations in a solid if the solid is absorbing. In an absorbing medium, the amplitude of the wave, the intensity of the wave, they are decreasing as the wave penetrates into the solid. And therefore, we need to write the plane wave like this. It still looks like a plane wave, but now the wave vector that we need is complex. And so the wave vector has a real part and an imaginary part. And um, the real part is responsible for dispersion or for the phase of the wave and the imaginary part is responsible for the 
um, absorption of the wave. And we can write this in terms of unit vectors u and v. And now the point that I made uh, in the last lecture where you asked me a question was, well, how can it be that the u and the v are not parallel to each other? So that is how it actually is that the attenuation, which is described by <coughs> the v, the complex part, the imaginary part, and the propagation, which is described by this vector u, they are not along the same direction. This is mentioned in Landau Lifshitz, and I've added the paragraph where this is mentioned. And uh, Landau Lifshitz, they're not usually shy about going into detail. But this is one, a rare instance where it says, well, we will just consider a special case where they are parallel. Uh, so that was disappointing. Uh, but then when you look at Jackson, then uh, Jackson uh, uh, goes deeper into the fact that these two are not parallel. There is also another text, a very old electromagnetic theory text from 1941 by Stratton. And then there's an entire book dedicated to the subject by Klemov and also some uh, more recent papers. This one here is from 1994. So these papers describe a formalism uh, where the relationship between these vectors u and v are described as a function of the optical parameters of the solid, the optical constants of the solid. Uh, u and v will be non-parallel even in the case of isotropic systems. So we do not need anisotropy. Even in an isotropic systems, these two are not parallel. So that means that the planes of constant intensity are described by this vector v. So that has to do with attenuation. And the planes of constant phase are described by this vector u. So the planes of constant intensity and the planes of constant uh, phase are not parallel to each other. Um, in practice, I never think much about this because in practice, I measure the reflected beam or I measure the transmitted beam. So in practice, I always measure a beam in air or in vacuum. I never measure the beam inside the sample. But inside the sample, the uh, propagation of the wave is actually very complicated. Now, I try to understand this deeper, and I try to give you two or three more slides. But I spent, like I said, I spent a couple of hours on this, and then I decided to give up uh, because um, uh, I probably would need a few months to really go through the uh, math and to really understand this in detail. But if you're really interested in this, so we will post the slides very soon, right, Mareike? So you can read, you know, you can try to read these books and then maybe you can explain it to me, okay? <laughs> very good. Homework. homework, yes, homework. Okay. So, but like I said, it's, it's not that important what the actual wave does. It's just important that we understand what we measure and what we can learn about the sample. Um, so, in the last lecture, we uh, talked about the oscillations of bound charges, which are described with the Lorentz model. And this is the dielectric function, uh, which corresponds to the... Um, polarization oscillations of bound charges. And then if we drop the restoring force, a charge, a free charge has no restoring force. Therefore, the Lorentz expression simply reduces to the Drude expression by setting this omega zero. Uh, the resonance frequency is zero because there's no restoring force. And the uh, numerator is related to a plasma frequency. And the plasma frequency in the Lorentz case uh, comes from the density of bound charges, whereas the plasma frequency for, uh, in, the, in the Drude case comes from the density of free charges. So we have two different plasma frequencies here corresponding to the bound charges and to the free charges. So if we think of a semiconductor like silicon, 
we have four bound charges, uh, 2s and 2p. So we have four bound charges, and we have a very, very small number of free charges which come from the doping, which might be uh, one per every million atoms, there might be a free charge in there. Um, in practice, we do not, uh, we do not uh, so we can apply the Drude model to metals and we can apply the Lorentz model to uh, insulators, but in practice we will pro usually need both of these models together uh, in order to describe a model. So we need to add, we need to add the Drude dielectric function and the Lorentz dielectric function to get this uh, Drude Lorentz model. And the reason that we can add the two terms together comes from the uh, superposition principle that if we have two charges that both have an electric field, then we can simply add the two electric fields together. So that is what we can do here. Uh, so this is the uh, Drude part and this is the Lorentz part and those two together give us the uh, drew de Lorentz dielectric function. And again, we have a uh, uh, plasma frequency here for the free charges. This plasma frequency, as I define it here, is sometimes called the unscreened plasma frequency. There is also a screened plasma frequency where we have the screening constant epsilon here in the denominator, but I will use the unscreened plasma frequency. If you use commercial software or if you use any type of software to model your spectra, then your, your model may ask for a plasma frequency. So it is very important to understand whether the plasma frequency you put into your model is that the unscreened plasma frequency or is it the screened plasma frequency where I have this epsilon in the denominator. Uh, instead of using a uh, plasma frequency also for the um, density of the bound charges. I have used this amplitude here multiplied by the square of the resonance frequency in the uh, numerator and there is some advantage to do this. And again, if you have commercial software, then you may see different types of uh, Lorentz oscillators in the software. This one here is my favorite. And why is that my favorite? Well, if the frequency goes to zero, then these two terms are zero and the uh, resonance frequency cancels out. And the only thing that remains at zero frequency is this amplitude A. So this amplitude A is related to the difference between the static dielectric constant and the high frequency dielectric constant. So that's why it is convenient to write it like this. So make sure that you uh, carefully select the, the Lorentz oscillator that you want for your model. Don't just pick the default one, but you know there's a drop down menu where you can select uh, different ones perhaps. Uh, we have two different uh, damping rates or broadening parameters. The uh, scattering rate for the free charges will be different from the scattering rate for the bound charges. And um, uh, so this is the uh, Drew de Lorentz model, which describes realistic solids which have both free and bound charges. May I ask you? Yeah. So this amplitude of bound charges. Yes. It looks like amplitude has usually some units. Amplitude in meters or I don't know. But here it is, of course, A is contribution to fermion, to static fermion. Uh, how I can imagine there is this amplitude. Uh, for me, it is contribution to static permittivity. Uh, so the question is about the units of this A. So we agree that this A is the difference between the high frequency permittivity and the low frequency or static permittivity. So that we agree on. The question is if it does not have if it does not have a unit, how can it be an amplitude? I would say that's, that's semantics. 
Um, there are definitions of the oscillator strength, which include both this parameter A and the uh, uh, resonance frequency. Um, as soon as you start having units, um, it becomes a question of which units do I choose, and um, calculating with units can sometimes be difficult. So uh, I find it easier to use this dimensionless quantity A because it's just a number. It's just a number which in many cases I can just read off the spectrum because it is the difference between the uh, high frequency and low frequency dielectric constant. So I don't know how to answer that. It's I'm it asking because my student asked me a similar question yesterday. Okay. And he found it somewhere in paper that it is connected with dynamic polarization. And so he was curious, like polarization. Yeah, because it's very close. Well, okay, polarization. It is not polarization. It's microcoulomb or something like that. I do not know it's not electric. But here it is contributing to the permittivity. So perhaps I should look up what I should look up the term amplitude in Wikipedia or in the dictionary <laughs> to see whether it meets that um, <coughs> whether it meets that classification. Yeah, but here is the A A dimension. Uh, is completely, completely fine. Uh, then maybe your student can be referred to uh, the person in the back. Uh, and uh, because, you know, he feels that uh, an amplitude does not necessarily have to have a, a dimension. So, the, yeah. Um, so this is the uh, Drew de Lorentz model. So now we want to look at a schematic for what will this Drew de Lorentz model look like uh, for an actual material. And... Um, this is, uh, here we are plotting the real part and the imaginary part of the photon energy in the infrared spectral region and in the uh, visible and UV region. And um, I usually find it more convenient to discuss the imaginary part of epsilon because the imaginary part of epsilon tells me where the absorption occurs. The real part is then simply the chromoschronic transform of the imaginary part. So in my view, and again, that's probably debatable, in my view, the physics is contained in epsilon 2. Uh, when you look at papers, in many cases, instead of seeing epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, you will see n and k. So if you write a paper, what, what figures are you going to put in there? Are you going to put epsilon or are you going to put n and k? It probably depends on the audience that you want to have, but from the physics perspective or even from the chemistry perspective, the epsilon 2 tells us what absorbs, and that is really what I find more convenient. Uh, you see we have this nice uh, Lorenzian or Gaussian shape. If you plot k, you know, you get this asymmetric line shape. So epsilon 2 is probably easier to understand. So let's start by looking at epsilon 2 for, a, for an actual material. Um, if, there are, um, if there are at least partially ionic bonds, then there will be bonds which have a dipole moment. And as the atoms move uh, to, to the lattice vibrations, the, uh, there will be an oscillating dipole, and this oscillating dipole can absorb infrared light, and that absorption we describe with a uh, Lorentz term. So we need one. So we need to uh, find the normal modes of the um, oscillating. Uh, we need to find the normal modes of the lattice vibrations, and for each normal mode, if the dipole mode change, if the dipole moment changes for that mode, for each of such infrared active mode, we need a Lorentz oscillator. Then, uh, so that's the first mechanism of absorption, that's the lattice vibrations. Uh, the second source of, of absorption is, uh, comes from the free carriers. And uh, here you see that the uh, free carrier absorption occurs at an energy which is higher than the phonon absorption. <coughs> 
Uh, if that's the case, then this phonon will be damped and we won't see it. But depending on the carrier density, the free carrier absorption can also be at much lower energies. And then we see both the free carrier absorption and the phonon absorption. So uh, the phonon absorption uh, has a relatively low energy because the masses of the uh, atoms are large. So these are lattice vibrations and the masses are large. And because the masses are large, the resonance frequency for lattice vibrations is rather small. If we think about electronic vibrations, so that the bound electrons vibrate, then the electronic mass is uh, significantly smaller, maybe a hundred, a thousand, or even more. So the resonance frequency for electronic vibrations of bound electrons will be very large. So here we see this peak, which comes from the um, charges of electronic vibrations from the, uh, uh, yeah, this, this is the absorption due to electronic vibrations and it has much higher energy. Um, this electronic absorption we also call interband absorption because that is in a band structure picture is associated with a transition from a bound state into an unfilled state from a valence band to a conduction band. So, uh, First, I want to talk about metals, and then I will talk about semiconductors, and then I will talk about insulators, and we'll see how far we'll get. So first, we want to talk about metals, and here is a uh, periodic table, and um, most of the elements are metals, and the metals here in the first row, we call them alkali metals, in the second uh, I'm sorry, column. The first column, those are the alkali metals. The second column, those are the uh, alkaline earths. And then what is shown here, those are called bad metals. And uh, aluminum is a notorious bad metal, but actually it is one of the best metals that we can have, and I will show you why that is. And um, germanium, the chemists also consider germanium as a metal, and germanium is certainly not a metal, it is a semiconductor. But uh, when it was first uh, found, then it was not very poor, and therefore people thought that it was uh, a metal. And then here in the middle, we have uh, the transition metals, and then of course we have the lanthanides and actinides, so these are the rare earths and these here are radioactive, so we don't worry about them as material scientists. And um, this column here, you see copper, silver, and gold, and these are called the noble metals. So why are the noble metals so noble? As a physicist, I would say that the noble metals are noble because they have a fully they have a completely full D shell. So these noble metals have a completely full D shell. Nickel is my favorite metal. And nickel is a near noble metal because the D shell is almost full, but not quite. And that, so therefore, there's an important difference in the optical constants for nickel and for copper. And um, then in, in the other transition elements, of course, the uh, D shells are not full. The second thing I wanted to uh, say about metals is that the, uh, the atomic radii of metals vary. And if we go down in the atomic table, then the atomic radius increases. So that should be obvious, that as the shells get bigger and bigger, the atomic radius gets bigger. The second thing we need to consider is that if we go to the right, the atomic radius decreases. So if we compare sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, then aluminum is a much better metal than sodium for two reasons. And the first reason is that the atomic radius of aluminum is much smaller than the atomic radius of sodium, 
that's the first difference. And the second difference is that the alkali metals have only one free electron per atom. The earth alkaline metals have two free electrons per atom. And aluminum and gallium and indium, they have three free electrons per atom. So aluminum is a better metal than sodium because it has three times as many electrons and yet it occupies less space. So the carrier density in aluminum is maybe three to four times larger than the carrier density of sodium. So, yes? Um, there is a difference between atomic radii and ionic radii. So whether this is a, uh, a hydrogen atom or whether this is hydrogen bound to something else that can significantly um, change the radius of the atom, of the, of the hydrogen. So. Um, I did a, so the way that I prepare for these lectures is that I, I have a concept I need to explain, so I look it up on, on Google and then I look at images and then I try to find the best image that explains my point. So this was one of the images that I downloaded, but if you do a Google search for ionic radius, then you will see a very different plot. And uh, I found one image which actually compares the atomic radius and the ionic radius. And there are big differences. So your question was, you thought that hydrogen was much larger than many other elements. And my response is that that's probably because we're thinking about a different type of radius, maybe an ionic radius rather than an atomic radius. Yeah. So uh, using these considerations for uh, metals, they're the atomic size and the uh, carrier density. And by the way, I'm plotting atomic radius. Why am I plotting atomic radius here and not ionic radius? So I'm plotting the atomic radius because in a metal, let's say aluminum, the aluminum atoms in a metal are un, uh, the aluminum atoms in aluminum metal um, have an oxidation, st are, are neutral. They're not, you know, they have not accepted or given up some of their electrons. So the aluminum atoms in aluminum are neutral, so that's why I'm plotting the atomic radius. If I was looking at a material, let's say, at, um, if I was looking at aluminum nitrite, then, well, then there is a, a charge transfer, and then the radius of aluminum in aluminum nitrite is probably different from the radius of aluminum in, uh, in the aluminum metal. So now what we can do is we can calculate the plasma frequency as a function of, uh, we can calculate the plasma frequency for different elements because we know that the uh, carrier density is the carrier density is the number of electrons uh, divided by the uh, volume of the uh, atom. And we see that the alkali metals, they have a rather small plasma frequency because the carrier density of alkali metals is rather small. Uh, for two reasons. First, because the alkali metals only have one free electron, and second, because the alkali atoms are rather small. The element with the highest free carrier density is beryllium. So beryllium is here. So beryllium has two electrons per atom, and it has a rather small atomic radius. But aluminum, is, has the carrier density of aluminum is almost as good, almost as large as that of beryllium because aluminum has three electrons per atom and it is even smaller than, uh, the, it's, it's smaller than magnesium, for example. 
So um, the black in black, I'm showing the alkali metals, and in uh, red, I'm showing the uh, alkaline earths. And aluminum is here, and then in this gold color here shows the uh, noble metals, uh, copper, silver, and gold. And perhaps, uh, of course, copper is the uh, most common metals that is used to make wires. And that has to do not only with the high uh, plasma frequency of copper, but also with the low scattering. And in a, in a uh, noble metal, the scattering will be reduced compared to other metals. And, but also uh, aluminum is also very attractive to make wires because the carrier density is so high. And especially for airplane wirings where weight is an issue, uh, uh, aluminum wiring may be uh, useful. And gold, of course, is another good metal to make wires, but uh, gold is rather expensive. But nevertheless, for many applications where conductivity is important, uh, gold is being used. So um, using this formula, uh, using the uh, carrier density for metals, we can calculate the plasma frequency. And um, for most materials, uh, the plasma frequency is, you know, for some metals, it is somewhere in the uh, visible, but it can go up very high into the ultraviolet. Yes, so the, uh, the question is about the uh, linear relationship. The linear relationship is between the square of the plasma frequency and the uh, uh, carrier density. So what you will see here is that I have made this plot in origin and I have a scale which is not linear, yeah? So with origin, you can, you can, ex you can uh, uh, define uh, functions for the scale. So, that's, so the, uh, the square of the plasma frequency is proportional to the carrier density. Yeah? So uh, this is a graph I showed you uh, last time. The, I showed you uh, a lot of pictures about the functional relationship of, uh, of, me of the Drude model. So before we look at some actual experimental data, um, let's look at epsilon again. So epsilon uh, goes to uh, epsilon two goes up to, to uh, uh, so epsilon two goes to plus infinity and epsilon one goes to minus infinity. And we said last time that that's really only true if the scattering rate is zero. And uh, so let's not get into that again. Uh, Epsilon one, that's the red curve, is negative below the plasma frequency, which we have chosen to be three electron volts. And I've chosen a uh, broadening of one electron volt. So here again, you see the difference between epsilon and n and k. And you know, the, I think the curves here for epsilon one and epsilon two, I think these curves are easier to understand than the n and k. You know that the, the n has this minimum here, and the k is uh, uh, does not drop uh, quite as nicely. So, based on these, uh, on on this um, shape of the dielectric function, um, we see that the dielectric function uh, is negative. Now, which slide am I going to? Okay, so the the extinction coefficient and the uh, epsilon two become very small uh, near and above the plasma frequency. So if epsilon two goes to zero, then that means that uh, the metal becomes transparent at the plasma frequency. And um, I don't know how many of you have watched the Star Trek movies. Uh, but uh, there is this one movie based in San Francisco where the chief engineer invents transparent aluminum to transport the whales. 
So uh, how can it be that a metal becomes transparent? This is something that we're not so familiar with. So let's look at the absorption coefficient. Let's look at N and K for potassium. And this, this curve here, this is the extinction coefficient for potassium. And potassium has a plasma frequency of somewhere around four electron volts. So 4.4 electron volts is the um, plasma frequency of potassium. That corresponds to a wavelength of 280 nanometers or 2800 angstroms. So this is the absorption coefficient. The visible part is to the right, the UV part is to the left. So here at 280 nanometers you see a sharp drop in the absorption coefficient of the absorption coefficient right at the plasma frequency. So this potassium almost becomes transparent if it wasn't for the absorption from the bound electrons that are still in the metal. So the free electrons actually would give us a transparent metal, but the absorption from the bound electrons are, give us the residual absorption of a metal in the ultraviolet. Nevertheless, there are experiments which demonstrate that thin layers of um, alkali metals become transparent. And there is this paper here from 1933. And um, what you see here, so this is a photograph of the transmission of a thin layer of metal. So they made this bulb and they evaporated some metal, very thin. Uh, you can imagine it's not so easy to measure alkali metals because they are very unstable. They immediately react with um, oxygen and water. And let's look at this curve here. This is sodium. Um, the top line is the spectrum of the lamp and the hydrogen lamp has most intensity at around 4,000 or 3,000 angstroms. So this is the spectrum of the lamp. That's the transmission spectrum without a sample. And now let's measure the transmission of a sample, which is a thin sodium film. And you see that the transmission is zero above 2,100 nanometers. But at 2,100 nanometers, all of a sudden the light gets through. So sodium becomes transparent at 2100 angstroms. Potassium becomes transparent at 3000 angstroms, which is exactly what we see here. Potassium becomes transparent. Rubidium becomes transparent at 3500. And cesium becomes transparent at 4000 angstroms. So metals actually can become transparent if they are as if they are thin films. And if they do become transparent, then they're more transparent in the UV than in the visible because the uh, free carrier absorption in the UV becomes very weak. So this is the first consequence of the uh, Drude model that um, metals become transparent above the plasma frequency. Now the second thing is that, uh, the second important fact is that uh, metals are very shiny, right? Metals are very shiny. So the reflectivity of a metal is exactly one, the reflectivity of an ideal metal is exactly one up to the plasma frequency and then it drops. So the reflectivity of a metal would drop above the plasma frequency. So why is it that the reflectivity of a metal is one below the plasma frequency? So here we're doing some math. Uh, this is the Drude model. And um, first what we do is we set the broadening equal to zero. That keeps the math simpler. So then um, the uh, dielectric function from the Drude model is 1 minus omega plasma squared over omega squared. So this is a real number because we've ignored the damping. And this number is negative if the frequency is less than the plasma frequency. So below the plasma frequency, epsilon is real and negative. 
And then the refractive index is the square root of the uh, epsilon and the, uh, therefore the refract complex refractive index of a metal below the plasma frequency is purely imaginary. The real part is zero. And now we calculate the reflectance. So the reflectance is the complex n minus one divided by the complex n plus one and the complex magnitude squared. But n is equal to zero because the, uh, the refractive index is purely imaginary. So n is equal to zero. And then we have to write out uh, this uh, complex square and then we see that there are two blue terms that cancel each other and give a factor of minus one and the two red terms also cancel each other and give a factor of minus one. So we have minus one times minus one is equal to plus one. So for a, for a good metal, the reflectivity really is one below the plasma frequency and then it drops. So let's look at experimental data to see if this actually happens. And uh, this is the reflectivity of silver. And you see the reflectivity is one and then it drops. Same for aluminum. Well, aluminum is a little bit different. The reflectivity of aluminum is not quite one and then it drops at the plasma frequency. So, uh, that shows, so the Druder model explains why the reflectivity of metal is very high and that's why we use uh, mirrors to, uh, that's why we use mirrors made of metal uh, as bare metal uh, to get uh, high reflection coefficients. Of course, in reality today, we use coatings um, with various dielectrics to protect the metals and also to enhance their reflectivity, but even a bare metal gives us uh, very high reflection coefficients. So, uh, this explains why the reflectivity is high, but uh, there are some differences between uh, what we measure and what we expect. So, for example, for silver, um, it's a noble metal, so we have one electron per uh, atom has a high reflectance, but we expect that the plasma frequency for silver uh, should drop here. Uh, we, we know that the plasma frequency of, of silver is here, so the reflectivity should stay high and then drop here. But for some reason, it drops earlier, not already here. So we will look into the question why that is. Why, is the why does the reflectivity of silver drop earlier? And um, f we can also look at aluminum. And um, aluminum has three electrons, it has a high reflectance. The plasma frequency is 16 electron volts. So for aluminum, really, the uh, reflectance is rather high, and then it drops at the plasma frequency of 16 electron volts. Um, if we set the damping equal to zero, then we get uh, the reflectivity is exactly one, like I've showed you. And uh, in a real metal, we will have some scattering. And if we include a, a reasonable amount of scattering of the electrons, then we get this dashed curve. But this dashed curve or no amount of scattering can explain why there is this sudden drop in the reflectance at around 1.5 electron volts in aluminum. So why is that? Why, why is the reflectance of aluminum not 100%? Not why do we see this drop at 1.5 eV? Uh, the answer for that is in the band structure of aluminum. So I am plotting the energy versus the wave vector. And um, aluminum has a Fermi level which is given by the dashed line. The Fermi level means that the electronic states below the Fermi level are filled and the electronic states above the Fermi level are empty. At least that's true at absolute zero, at zero temperature. 
So what can happen now is that an electron is sitting here at the bottom of this arrow and the electron can absorb a photon and then we can excite this electron into an unfilled conduction band. And the same can happen over here near the K point. So uh, photons, uh, electrons in the valence band can make interband electronic transitions at W and at K. And this electronic absorption causes an absorption band at 1.5 electron volts. Whenever we have a band of total reflection, we are, very, we are extremely sensitive to small absorption coefficients. So let me say that again because that's important. Whenever we have a band of total reflection, we are very sensitive to small absorption processes in that band. So here, what we see, this initial dip in the reflectance of aluminum, that comes from these weak absorption processes, uh, from these interband transitions from the valence band to the conduction band. So here we drop and then we stay constant as expected, and then at the plasma frequency there is another drop as expected. Yes? May I ask, uh, uh, how high is it? Because there is a thin layer, right? Uh, when uh, you think about the reflection, and there will be some thin layer at which it uh, um, no longer penetrates the magnetic uh, the electromagnetic field. And then uh, this uh, transition should occur only in this uh, narrow region, right? So the, the question is about the skin effect and the skin layer. Yes, and the, the relation to the magnitude of the skin uh, because of this uh, intrusion. Yes. So uh, we do not really need to think about the skin effect. We do not need to think about a skin layer. The skin layer is not a layer. The skin layer is not a layer like an oxidized, uh, an oxi uh, an, a native oxide on the aluminum. So if you think you have a perfect aluminum uh, surface and then it's not in UHV and then you will, the, the aluminum will form a very stable oxide and perhaps you have some water on top. So these are really layers. But what you call the, sk the skin layer isn't really a layer, it is still perfect aluminum. The skin layer or the, sk uh, the skin depth describes the penetration depth of the light into the metal which depends on the frequency. Okay, so um, here we're showing uh, epsilon 2 and epsilon 2 is equal to something multiplied by the refractive index and the absorption coefficient and the penetration depth of the light is 1 over the absorption coefficient and the skin depth is either twice or one half the uh, penetration depth. I, I don't remember exactly how it is defined. It has to do with the difference between uh, field strength and intensity. So the skin depth tells us how deep the wave will penetrate into the metal but it is not necessary to include that in any type of calculations. You don't have to draw a picture where you have a skin layer and a bulk layer. Everything is bulk. Yeah? But if I can ask, so yeah. the answer to this question of aluminium, uh, it seems to me that there is not only absorption of, the, of this interband absorption, but also the dent denting of the plasma is much higher. Therefore, you have a reflectivity lower even at higher frequencies. So the, in, the, 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 initial, the, the, initial, the initial drop is due to the uh, interband transitions, and then there is a damping, and therefore it drops if, off. If the damping will be really very small, ideally zero, yeah. then this interband and, uh, transition will not be seen because it will be squeezed into the yeah. plasma. If it goes, I have finite uh, damping, then uh, it's not seen. But let's say it's true phonons. Phonons are also absorption, and they are screened because in this range, 
formal frequencies the damping is low yeah i mean damping of plasma or reflectivity from plasma is so maybe for the camera I can rephrase your question and say how can it be that we see a, an absorption which is much less than the plasma frequency, shouldn't this be damped? And uh, I understand the question, I cannot answer that. It is obvious that we see that transition and uh, I'd like to go back to the point that I made earlier that below the plasma frequency we are very sensitive to small absorption coefficients. And therefore, we can see this interband absorption uh, even though it may be very weak. The question perhaps that you have is, why isn't this interband transition damped very strongly? And for lattice vibrations, for phonons in a metal, I would agree with you that we do not see phonons in a metal but I think the reason we don't see the phonon in a metal has to do with the, uh, has to do with the interaction between the uh, vibration of the phonon with the, with the free carrier. So the, the phonon is damped and very broad and therefore we don't see it. Uh, but you know, it is obvious that we see it here in, in aluminum and in order to explain this, in order to answer your question, what one, have, what one would have to do is we go back to our, we go back to our Drew de Lorentz model. And um, here is the free carrier absorption for aluminum, which I can write down. And then here I can write down an expression for the absorption from that interband transition. And I can also write down an absorption for uh, an expression for the phonons in aluminum. And what we will see is that if we choose the correct broadening parameters, then we can see the interband absorption, but we cannot see the phonon in aluminum. I think that's the answer to your question. Uh, I mean, my argument is if we will have plasma uh, like in silver with very small damping plasma, then this. And if you will take the same oscillator, interband ex uh, excitation in aluminum, it will be screened because of high or low damping of plasma. Here you have not only absorption or, or around one, one uh, electron volt, or two, but uh, also low reflectivity at 10 electron volt, which means this effect of high damping of plasma. And no, the damping, damping, no, no. The damping, the damp so this is, this is here in the, uh, so the question is about the damping and uh, you c if you model the Drude response, the if you model the Drude reflectivity, then no amount of damping can explain a drop, uh, can explain a 10% uh, a loss in reflectance due to damping. You need the interband transitions to explain this. And by the way, as I will show you in a minute, you see the same effect in silver. It's just a little more subtle, but I will get, I will get back to that. So, so here, so, uh, and now, uh, so um, I wanted to mention, and not just because you asked, but it was my intent to mention, and I need to add another reference here. Uh, some of you may know Professor Vogt from Berlin. You, you know him? Uh, so, or may have heard of him. So uh, uh, he gave a talk in uh, Charleston at the ellipsometry conference in uh, 1997. And uh, he disagrees with this commonly accepted explanation for the uh, uh, optical constants of aluminum. And what he says at this drop is due to oxygen inclusions in aluminum, uh, which has nothing to do with the plasma either. And uh, so and he finds uh, from his simulations that very, very small uh, amounts of oxygen in aluminum, like 10 to the minus 6 or less, so small that you could not find it with any uh, uh, an analytical technique. Uh, so he finds that this, uh, this peak here, this drop in the reflectance could also be due to small amounts of oxygen. But uh, 
that I, I don't really know. I just wanted to point out that there is another alternative. OK, so um, after discussing aluminum, let's go to the noble metals. So this is copper. And uh, it has one electron. And we know the uh, size of the copper atom. And therefore, we can calculate the uh, plasma frequency for copper and the plasma frequency for copper. The plasma frequency for copper is 10.8 electron volts. So we expect that the reflectance of copper should be 1, and then it should drop at the plasma frequency. Uh, but obviously, that's not what happens. Um, copper is uh, not white. Copper is clearly red. And the reflectance of copper drops very rapidly between 2 and 3 electron volts and has this type of a shape. So what happens here in copper? So remember that uh, copper is a noble metal. And in copper, we have uh, 4 s electrons and we have 3 d electrons. And um, I think I have a slide for that later. Um, let me see if I. Yes. So this slide I should have had earlier. So uh, no, I don't want to say. I, I want to explain it differently. Yes. So. The 4s electrons are itinerant. That means that they can travel through the crystal as they wish. They're free to move as they want to. Whereas the 3d electrons, they are localized, highly correlated. And the 3d electrons prefer to stay near the atom where they came from. Therefore, the energy of the 3d band in copper is um, pretty constant and the so this 3d energy in of the electrons in copper is very similar to the atomic 3d energy so there's not much difference between the solid and the atom uh, so the that's why the density of states of the 3d electrons is um, uh, very sharp there is the dominant contribution to the energy of the 3D electrons is the potential energy. There is not much contribution from the kinetic energy. So they're localized. The 4S electrons, on the other hand, are truly free. Because they are free, they can move. That means they have kinetic energy. And the total energy is the sum of potential energy and kinetic energy. And because they can move, the range of kinetic energies that they can acquire is rather large, and therefore the 4s electrons have a rather uh, broad peak in the density of states. So given this density of states, electrons can make transitions. So the 3d electrons can make transitions to the Fermi level. So the 3d electrons can uh, transition into the 4s band and therefore uh, there is an absorption peak which we expect to happen at the separation for between the 3d band and the Fermi edge. So the first question you might ask is well how can it be that I can make a transition from a d band to an s band? The selection rule should be that delta L should be plus or minus 1. So I can go from D to P or from P to S, but I should not be allowed to make a transition from D to S. So the answer here is that the argument that uh, delta L must be equal to plus or minus 1, that argument uh, was derived for a hydrogen atom in the Bohr model. And that argument assumed a spherical symmetry. But the uh, atoms in copper do not, have, do not see spherical symmetry. We have a cubic crystal. And therefore, the selection rules that were derived for, a, uh, for an isotropic spherical system, these selection rules no longer apply in a solid.
So in a solid, rather than looking at SPD, rather than looking at the representations of the rotation group, in a solid we need to look at the uh, representations of the point group and each of these bands here has a certain representation of the point group and then we need to look at the selection rules in that point group to determine which, allow which transitions are allowed or forbidden. So the fact that we can move from 3 to S, from D to S, uh, that should not bother you, and if you really want to know, you can go through the group theory and calculate it. But that's just a, a result of the crystal field splitting. And this picture here shows the uh, band structure, energy versus wave vector, and again, uh, the, the spaghetti bands that go across, those are the D bands, because they have pretty much all the same energy. And then here with a little bit of fantasy, you know, this is the 4S band and it, so the 4S band penetrates the spaghetti lines of the 3D bands. So the 4S band goes like a parabola. And this parabola uh, is what you would expect for kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is K squared over 2M. So this parabola, that's the, um, Put, uh, that's the kinetic energy contribution to the potential energy of the 4S band, which is here. So that's the band structure of copper. We have the itinerant 4S bands and the uh, localized 3D states. And then in copper, we can make transitions from the D bands into the uh, 4S states right here at the Fermi edge. So, um, if we measure this energy, if we measure the initial drop of the reflectivity, then that tells us how deep the 3D band is below the Fermi edge. So the 3D band is around two electron volts below the Fermi edge. We see that here. So this distance here, that's the uh, binding energy of the 3D electrons. So at higher energies, the reflectance drops because we uh, can make these transitions and therefore the uh, reflectivity of copper drops at a much lower energy um, than expected from the Drude theory. So that's a noble metal. And um, silver and gold have similar properties than copper, however, for silver, the binding energy of the uh, D band in silver is much larger than in copper or gold and therefore um, the silver remains highly reflective at much higher photon energies than copper or gold. So, uh, this distance here varies between silver, copper, and gold. You're more likely to make visible mirrors with silver than with gold or uh, copper. On the other hand, if you want to make really good infrared mirrors, then you would use gold because then it doesn't matter that the reflectance drops uh, in the visible. And that also explains the different colors of gold, silver, and copper. Um, so we've talked about the uh, reflectivity of noble metals and, uh, and that was these arguments, these figures are tr uh, were drawn for bulk metals. So what if we look at nanoparticles? Uh, if we look at nanoparticles, then we see that the absorption coefficient of a nanoparticle uh, depends on the size of the nanoparticle. So what can happen in a nanoparticle, and this is not an effect that we would see in the bulk, is that the electromagnetic wave can excite uh, plasmon oscillations of the electrons within the nanoparticle. And then the absorption uh, that we observe depends on the size of the 
uh, absorption uh, depends on the size of that nanoparticle. So gold is typically yellow in the bulk, but gold nanoparticles can have any color you like if you just vary the magnitude of the nanoparticle. And uh, when I worked at Motorola, they deposited the back of their layers with gold. And then the gold that they deposited came out, turned out green. So how can gold be green? So then they came to us and we had to do all kinds of chemical analysis with their gold. And the gold was absolutely pure, but it was still green. And the reason it was green was simply because of the surface roughness and the microstructure of their gold. It was not a flat, perfectly flat gold film. So if your gold turns green, uh, it hasn't spoiled. It may just be a different surface morphology. So here you see two different uh, absorption coefficients for two samples uh, of a nanoparticle of, of different sizes. And there are ways to uh, explain the absorption coefficient. That there are ways to explain these plasmon oscillations. Uh, Clausius Mosotti is, is one relationship. And um, uh, this is an example of an expression for an effective medium approximation. So if you have these nanoparticles suspended in a liquid, then uh, what we're seeing here is not really a pure system, but it is an effective medium consisting of a dielectric, uh, like a liquid or a glass, and the metal, which is metal nanoparticles, which are embedded in the dielectric. If the particle size is much less than the wavelength, then we describe this as an effective medium and then the dielectric constant of the effective medium can be calculated from the individual dielectric constants of the constituents. So epsilon m is the dielectric constant of the metal. Epsilon d is the dielectric constant of the dielectric. And um, then there is some formula how they need to be combined. There are various different ways how to combine these. Uh, Clausius Mosotti is one. There's Maxwell Garnet. Uh, there is Brueggemann. And if you ever have to deal with such a mixture, then you have to think about which effective medium approximation is most appropriate. Um, the reason why people uh, use these nanoparticles, one reason why people use these nanoparticles is that they enhance uh, molecular absorption so you might put some nanoparticles down uh, on a silicon surface and then do Raman spectroscopy. And um, whenever you uh, have a monolayer of an organic compound or something on top of these gold nanoparticles, then the Raman spectrum will be enhanced uh, very significantly compared to having just a bare monolayer uh, of this organic compound without a uh, layer of nanoparticles. Um, so after the noble metals, we move to the near noble metals. Remember the near noble metals were like nickel and platinum and they were in the column before you get to the noble metals. So since uh, they are nearly noble, that means that there are, there are filled D states, which are shown in gray, and there are unfilled D states, which are in orange. And then, of course, we also have the unoccupied S states. So for a near noble metal, this D band moves up, and the Fermi level goes straight through the goes uh, through somewhere through this 3D band. And um, for such near noble metals, they have a dielectric function uh, up to uh, above one electron volts. The dielectric function really looks like we would expect it for a metal. We have this 
divergence of epsilon 1 towards minus infinity and we have this divergence of epsilon 2 towards uh, plus infinity but then below one electron volts all of a sudden the curve changes and moves up rather than keep going down and the reason for that is because we can make transitions from D to D so these are called D intraband transitions and these D to D transitions are responsible for the absorption of uh, transition metals which are not noble. And again, you might ask, how can I make a transition from D to D? Well, the D splits in a cubic field. So the fivefold degenerate D state moves, uh, splits into a doublet and a triplet, and the uh, spherical selection rules, the isotropic selection rules no longer apply and therefore we can make transitions from D to D. And um, therefore, if you look at the uh, article by Lynch and Hunter in Pollock's handbook on optical constants, uh, so uh, David Lynch writes um, that transition metals never really exhibit through the absorption uh, uh, transition metals never really exhibit through the behavior in the infrared. And the reason why transition metals are not uh, through the metals in the infrared is because of these uh, D states and these, these interband, these intraband transitions uh, can happen at arbitrarily low energies and therefore even going to longer and longer wavelengths, platinum will never be a through the metal. And we also see that in, in nickel. So that is uh, the opinion that was expressed by, uh, uh, by David Lynch. And these data are some data I took uh, at Motorola uh, about 20 years ago for platinum. So uh, nickel is my favorite metal and this is work that is done by one of my uh, graduate students uh, at New Mexico State University and um, on this plot here, I have shown you the uh, dielectric function. Uh, but of course, the dielectric function diverges. And therefore, it's very hard to deal with the uh, dielectric function. So it is more convenient to multiply the dielectric function with the photon energy that removes this divergence. And instead, we plot the conductivity and this optical conductivity has the same units like the DC conductivity. And uh, it is in, has units of 1 over ohm centimeters. The DC conductivity of nickel is 143,000 per ohm centimeter. That's a number taken from the literature. So one of my goals has always been, you know, can we measure the, uh, conduct, the optical conductivity at low enough wavelengths at long enough wavelengths so that we can actually uh, recover this DC conductivity using optical metals. So why do I want to do this? Well, how do you measure this, this DC conductivity? You take a piece of nickel and you need to uh, uh, apply four contacts and then you do an electrical measurement. So if one could measure the, the DC conductivity using optical techniques, then one would not have to apply contacts and that therefore would be a much faster and non-destructive way of measuring uh, conductivity. And uh, so you see that this is the optical conductivity due to interband transitions. So this is the uh, Lorentz part, uh, the absorption peaks at one and a half and four and a half electron volts these absorption peaks are due to the oscillations of bound carriers in nickel. And then below 1.5 electron volts, the conductivity shoots up, but even at the lowest frequencies where we can measure about 30 milli electron volts or 250 wave numbers, even here at, at these measurement, at these long wavelengths, the optical sigma is still much smaller than the uh, DC sigma. Eventually this curve will this curve does not go to infinity. This curve will go up to about 140,000 and then it will turn over. At least that's what we hope. And on the top, I'm showing you the ellipsometric angles. 
uh, psi and delta for a bulk nickel surface, which are the basis for this uh, optical conductivity. And um, so here in nickel, okay, that's the picture I was looking for earlier. So for, for copper, I said that these are the 4S states, the itinerant states, and the spaghetti bands are the uh, 3D states. And um, if we compare that with the uh, band structure of nickel, we see again the spaghetti states, the spaghetti lines that go across, those are the uh, 3D states, and then the S states, they are these parabolas here and somewhere here, yeah. Uh, so these are the S states and these are the D states, and what you see here is that some of these spaghetti lines go, ab go above the uh, Fermi energy, which is here at zero electron volts. So some of the uh, D states go above the Fermi energy, and that means that the D states are only partially filled. And the further you go away from the uh, noble metals, the more the Fermi energy will move down relative to the energy of the D states. Um, this measurement is for bulk nickel and probably for a uh, bulk uh, single crystal of nickel. Um, so how does the, uh, how does the uh, dielectric function of nickel depend on thickness? And if you uh, deposit a very, very thin nickel film, let's say 50 angstroms, then um, depending on the method used to deposit the nickel and depending on the substrate, a 50 angstrom thin film may actually not be a thin film because there may be surface tension and the nickel may tend to coagulate uh, so instead of having a uniform film of nickel, uh, you have small islands. Uh, you are below what's called the percolation threshold. And therefore, for our case, we used uh, uh, physical vapor deposition, sputtering of nickel. Um, the 50 angstrom film was not metallic. So here, these films are all metallic they show that the conductivity increases uh, at the uh, longer wavelengths. So a 50 angstrom film, the conductivity, it would look like an insulator. There's, there's a band gap somewhere because the islands have not merged. But for the uh, films between 100 angstroms and 1,000 angstroms, the conductivity uh, looks like a metal that it becomes larger towards longer wavelengths. Uh, but you see clearly that there are differences. The uh, optical constants of nickel depend on the film thickness, and perhaps it should be obvious that the conductivity goes up as the thickness goes up. So if you have a thicker film, then you have less scattering at the bottom and top interfaces, and therefore the uh, conductivity of a thicker film is uh, is larger. So uh, you don't see, you see this not only in, in, uh, in electrical measurements, but also here in the optical measurements, we see a, a change in film thickness. So if you have a thin film of a material, you should never assume that the thin film has the same optical constants as the bulk, but it is important to characterize the optical constants of that film. Now, of course, when I'm showing this graph, some of you may be uh, shaking, your hands and, uh, shaking your heads and may say, no, 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 that's not how it is. Uh, this is probably some artifact. When you're measuring thin films, it is very difficult to understand, is the film really homogeneous or do you have some surface effects? And um, in order to get uh, these data here, I think uh, 
we've spent five years uh, trying to clean the, the nickel surface. So how do we prepare the best nickel surface? And uh, we've been working on that for five years. I think we figured it out now that uh, we have to put the nickel in UHV and heat it at 500 degrees Celsius overnight. And uh, that has been the, the most convenient way for us. And, and that was Farzin's work. That's what we found to be most uh, effective in order to clean the surface. When we started with our measurements on thin films, then um, the thin nickel films had significant layers of water on the surface. And that's why we need to put the film in UHV and heat it first. And then we, do these, we take these measurements. But even then, uh, we cannot exclude that there is still a thin layer of nickel oxide. So then we, we look at the nickel oxide lattice vibrations, the nickel oxide phonons, and then we do simulations. And then we can say, well, you know, if there were 10 angstroms of nickel oxide on top of nickel, then we should see that uh, in, in some sort of a phonon signature. So doing these measurements is very hard. And um, uh, so uh, in, in these pictures, and there is work by Ola Hundari, uh, which is also uh, some years ago, where he explains the uh, scattering in, in uh, polycrystalline metals uh, from grain boundaries, and then there may be some electrons which are in the bulk of the material, and the electrons which are at the grain boundaries may have uh, different mobilities and therefore also make a different contribution to the dielectric function. So uh, these... Uh, these metals tend to be rather dirty, so we cannot really get them as clean and as perfect as silicon, and therefore we see a lot more variations in the optical constants of metal. If you look at silicon, um, everybody agrees on what the dielectric function is. It may depend on the surface, but there's not much debate, oh, this is my silicon and this is your silicon. They're all the same. But when you look at metals, you see here these are different um, uh, these are different measurement results for platinum, and uh, there are very significant differences. And it's not just that you need to make a roughness correction, uh, but uh, this is the, the dashed line here is the result of Lynch and Hunter, and and you know Dave Lynch. Uh, I knew him very well when I was in Iowa, so he's a very uh, diligent person. So this is not just that uh, he was careless, and then these were our ellipsometry measurements later. So there are significant differences uh, in the metals based on their microstructure and other properties. Um, so uh, nickel and platinum are both near noble metals. And that's the picture I showed before, that we in, in nickel and platinum, we can have de-intraband transitions, and we can also have interband transitions from the D states to the S states. So both of these effects will show up in uh, nickel and platinum. But what's the difference between nickel and platinum? Well, in nickel, uh, we have three D states, and in platinum, we have five D states. And the four F states in platinum, they're entirely contained within the 5D band. But the nickel 3D states are more localized, and the platinum 5D states are broader, less localized, and therefore more, dis more dispersive. So we expect that uh, platinum, if uh, all things platinum should all be broader and nickel should be sharper. And uh, we can look at that uh, when we study nickel-platinum alloys. And in an alloy, there are two effects. There is the chemical variation as you go from one material to the other material. So you can do some sort of an interpolation between nickel and platinum to understand the alloy. But the other fact is that because you have an alloy, you have potential fluctuations. And the uh, nickel potential is different from the platinum potential. So your crystal is no longer periodic. And this deviation from periodicity gives you a scattering, uh, which we call alloy broadening. So both of these effects come into play, the alloy broadening and the uh, broadening in the 3Ds, uh, and the difference in the width of the 
platinum 5D and nickel 3D states. And uh, we can also look at the uh, more quantitatively, instead of looking at this cartoon, we can look at calculated density of states. And in red, you see the density of states for pure nickel. And in black, you see the density of states of the 5D states in platinum. So you see the bandwidth of the nickel 3D states is only about half of the broadening, uh, the width of the platinum 5D states. Um, these, the areas here and here, so these very narrow cones, uh, those are the uh, highly dispersive S states, the contribution to, of the S states to the density of states. And then uh, Lina Abdallah, she was my first PhD student at NMSU. Uh, she measured the, uh, op the uh, optical conductivity for nickel platinum alloys with different contents of, uh, uh, with different compositions. So here we have 10%, 10% platinum, 15% platinum, 20% platinum, 25% platinum. So here for 10% platinum, we see a uh, quite a pronounced peak, but then as we increase the uh, platinum concentration, this peak gets broader and broader. So I think you would agree that for the 25% alloy, uh, the peak is much broader than for the 10% alloy. And uh, why is nickel my favorite metal? So all of you carry nickel in your, um, uh, all of you carry nickel in your phones and in your laptops. So what uh, this shows a picture of a silicon CMOS field effect transistor with a 32 nanometer gate width. And um, this uh, brown, uh, the dark area, this is a transmission electron micrograph. So the dark area shows that you have a metal and the contacts to the source strain regions. So this part and this part, those are the contacts to the source strain region as well as the contacts to the polysilicon gate. They're all made with nickel silicide. And that's why we were interested in the uh, optical constants of nickel to see whether one can measure the nickel thickness or the nickel silicide thickness using optical methods. So, um, I will not talk as much about semiconductors as I will talk about metals because th this is uh, uh, a faster topic. So I think we should be done by 11. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. So uh, we've talked about metals and in the fourth column of the periodic table, we find semiconductors beginning with carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin. Uh, carbon or diamond, you might rather describe as an insulator because it has a very large band gap. Uh, tin, you might describe as a metal because it conducts much better than the other semiconductors. But if we look at the band structure of tin, then it really is a zero band gap semiconductor. Instead of... Uh, looking at semiconductors only in the fourth column of the periodic table. We can also look left and right. So if we mix gallium and arsenic, so we have three electrons here, five electrons here. So we mix gallium and arsenic and on average we get something that looks like germanium. So gallium arsenide has properties very similar to germanium. Um, so in metals, we said that we find a plasma frequency where the reflectivity drops. So this is indium antimonide. And um, so the plasma frequency is related to the density of electrons divided by the mass. And in doped semiconductors, so doping means, so here is indium and here is antimony. So indium antimonide should be somewhat like tin. Uh, so indium antimonide is a small band gap semiconductor. But if we add tellurium, 
then the tellurium has one electron too many. So the, if we replace, if we occasionally replace antimony with tellurium, if one of every million antimony atoms is replaced by tellurium, then we have a very small number of extra electrons in that crystal. So a doped semiconductor is one where we replace indium or antimony with a dopant, so we might replace indium with zinc, then we are missing electrons and we can replace, we can replace antimony with tellurium and then we add additional electrons. So um, we only do this with very low probability, so like one every million Electro, one every million atoms is replaced. So we do have free electrons in a doped semiconductor just like in a metal, but the carrier density is like a million times lower or depending on what, you know, what the doping concentration is. So here we are looking at um, the reflectivity of doped indium antimonide with various uh, levels of dopant concentrations. Now, uh, dopant concentrations are typically measured in one over cubic centimeters, not in one over cubic meters. So these numbers may appear off. But you see, if we go towards the infrared, then in the infrared, the reflectance is one and then it drops. So by measuring the reflectivity of uh, semiconductors, doped semiconductors, we can determine the carrier concentration and you see here a very nice drop at the plasma frequency. But the plasma frequency in a doped semiconductor is in the infrared region, not in the ultraviolet. And the reason for that, there's two reasons for that and one of them is the low carrier density. There's another reason and that has to do with the effective mass and I'll get to that later. So in doped semiconductors, just like in metals, we see a, a minimum in the reflectance near the plasma frequency. And uh, in this case, um, because the uh, interband transitions are at much, much higher energies, the interband transitions don't get in the way and therefore we can observe the Drude model actually much better in doped semiconductors than in a metal. So these data here are uh, reflectivity, but so why do people nowadays uh, measure infrared ellipsometry rather than in, uh, infrared reflectance? So if we do ellipsometry, then we measure Two, mature, two quantities, both an amplitude and a phase, and therefore we have direct access to the complex dielectric function without the need for a chromoschronic transform. And therefore, uh, it is easier, at least for me, to interpret the uh, dielectric function. Uh, it is easier for me to find features in the spectra and um, I have measured some crystals where I believe that we have been able to get more accurate results uh, for our ellipsometry measurements on crystals than with the uh, reflectance results that were in the literature. Uh, ellipsometry, obviously, because it's ellipsometry, we have information about film thickness, so we get depth information. Uh, sometimes what people do with infrared spectroscopy is that they have a film on a substrate. So you take a, you, you measure the transmission of your substrate and then you measure your transmission of the film plus substrate and then you just uh, subtract the two and you call that the uh, transmission of your film and therefore uh, you calculate the, the, the uh, absorbance of your film and you interpret it that way. Unfortunately, that, uh, uh, that's done quite often, uh, especially by chemists. But uh, the re one reason I did Maxwell's equations is, you know, from Maxwell's equation, we get the wave equation, we get Fresnel's equation. We cannot simply add the two together. If you have two materials, a, fi uh, a film and a substrate, you cannot say, you know, my absorption here, my absorption there, I just add them together. The equations don't work out that way because you are completely ignoring uh, 
interference effects. Um, depend, we, we are able to uh, some, uh, get information about anisotropy from the off-diagonal elements. Uh, we can perform ellipsometry measurements in a magnetic field. That's called the optical Hall effect. And um, in the absence of a magnetic field, we can get the plasma frequency and the scattering rate. And um, uh, if we turn on a magnetic field, then, uh, th you know, the plasma frequency has to do with the carrier density and the, the effective mass, but we cannot really separate the two. But by turning on a magnetic field, we get the origin, we get the additional Lorentz force. And that means from the plasma frequency, we actually go to the carrier density and the effective mass and the scattering rate. So what are the disadvantages of doing infrared ellipsometry? Uh, so in order to do uh, ellipsometry, we need to take about 15 reflectance spectra with different settings of the polarizing elements. So we have a rotating compensator and um, we have a rotating compensator and that needs to rotate 15 times. So uh, I'm a very patient person and I put the sample in and then I come back the next morning. I also, and then I get the data the next morning or I measure over the weekend. So all of that works very well for me. Uh, of course, that means that I measure a very small number of samples. So it's very time consuming. Uh, it requires polarizing elements and in the infrared, uh, we can use uh, wire grid polarizers. So they only, uh, so uh, a, parallel, a set of parallel wires, they only let the light through in one direction, uh, one polarization direction. Uh, compensators are more complicated. So we do need these uh, highly uh, characterized and, and highly, uh, very complicated polarizing elements. Um, we cannot focus the light with ellipsometry. And the reason we cannot focus the light is because the focusing destroys the accurate knowledge of the polarization. Uh, that's true, at least in a research case. Um, there are commercial uh, ellipsometers used in manufacturing where the light is focused down to a 30 micron spot size, but these instruments are not as accurate. As, uh, as instruments where there is no focusing. So we need large samples and the smallest samples that I've measured here on the infrared ellipsometer with good results were about five by 10 square millimeter. Five by five would be tricky. But if you have a, um, if you have a single crystal of some uh, not so common substance, which is only 10 microns or 100 microns large, then you're much better off doing reflectance with an infrared microscope. Uh, we do a lot of modeling with ellipsometry and that is an art. And perhaps the biggest disadvantage is that commercial instruments uh, are only available to, a, uh, to have a lower limit of 30 milli EV, which is about 250 microns. Yes. Uh, so the question is, do I need a substrate when I do a measurement? And the answer is no. So if I have a thin freestanding membrane, my my, uh, if I have a thin freestanding membrane, uh, then I can do ellipsometry measurements on that membrane. Um, I just have to be careful that there is not something behind that membrane which also reflects. Yes. So do you need a substrate to calculate your data or is it enough to have a substrate, uh, your, your uh, thin on substrate? Do you need to compare? Uh, you need to know. So your, your model, if you have a thin film on a substrate, then you have a model which includes the optical constants of the substrate and those of the film and you combine those two to calculate the optical response. So, uh, I do need a reference substrate. If I have a multiple, if I have a stack with multiple layers, uh, 
then I want as many samples as there are films. You know, you start with the bare substrate and then the substrate plus the first film, the substrate plus the first two films, and, and so on. And then, uh, if we're lucky, then we can get, uh, by, by a combination of all of these samples, we can get a, uh, the optical constants for all those layers. But if you're giving me an unknown substrate and an unknown film, then I probably cannot do much. Yeah, that, that was your point, right? Yeah. Well, my point was, if you change the substrate on the reference, you're going to lose the, the, the phase. Because you need to put them at the same place, exactly. No. That, that I don't understand. Um, you can cover half the substrate during their position, and then you have the reference substrate and the film, provided the deposition really did nothing. But sometimes just heating the substrate during the position may, may change the surface, so you have to be sensitive to that. So uh, if you want to measure at uh, even longer wavelengths, if you want to measure below 250 wave numbers, uh, what do you do? Uh, so there are no commercial instruments, uh, uh, commercial ellipsometry instruments below 250. Uh, you are lucky because there's one in Brno. So um, I hope that at some point I'll be able to go to Brno and, and do some measurements there with ellipsometry at very low uh, f uh, wave numbers and uh, maybe down to 10 or 50 wave numbers. And then there is an instrument in Nebraska and Carola went there in February. It is very cold in Nebraska in February. Uh, but there we can measure to uh, much lower energies. And um, uh, there's another one in Switzerland, and there are several infrared ellipsometers. Uh, there's one in Stuttgart, and there's other several, several instruments uh, at synchrotron sources, at synchrotron light sources. So it is possible to measure below 250 wave numbers. And then there's also ellipsometers in the terahertz spectral region. So uh, you can measure at 100 gigahertz or something like that at extremely long uh, wavelengths. So uh, we can do uh, infrared ellipsometry on doped semiconductors, but I think it is really getting late now. So uh, I should save something for my next lecture. And then uh, in my next lecture, we'll talk, about, um, we'll talk about ellipsometry on doped semiconductors and then also on, uh, we, we will look at lattice vibrations, which is an application of the Lorentz model. So it's uh, quarter till 11, so perhaps that's a good time to stop and uh, take additional questions. Yes. Nickel platinum, uh, looking at, uh, I did not have, I did not show data and I do not, we haven't published data on the infrared properties. So uh, nickel would be somewhere in between silver and aluminum. So uh, there should be a small drop in the infrared, but we have not calculated that. So um, you, uh, he, this shows the uh, optical conductivity of nickel in the infrared. And then from this uh, sigma, you can calculate the absorption coefficient and, uh, and then you get the, uh, uh, the complex refractive index and you can calculate what the reflectance loss is, but we did not calculate it. But I would assume that nickel probably will not reflect as well as silver or gold. 
because of these D intraband transitions that occur from these um, partially unfilled, par only partially filled D orbitals. Yes. So part of your uh, question has to do with the abruptness of the surface, right? Yes. And uh, like I told you, um, we've been cleaning nickel for five years and we're, you know, every student is trying to, I tell every student you clean it better than the previous one. So uh, it is very difficult to get this nickel clean and the best way that we found was that we heat it overnight at a high temperature. Uh, if you want to clean silicon, for example, it's the same thing that you uh, clean it as much as possible first with organic solvents and then with, uh, first you clean it with organic solvents and then with hydrofluoric acid to remove the native oxide but regardless of what you do, there's still some oxide left. And in the silicon case, what you can do is you flash heat it to a temperature very close to the melting point, and then whatever uh, oxide was remaining on the surface uh, is completely removed, and then you really have an atomically pure, an atomically clean surface. So um, you can also get atomically clean surfaces by cleaving a crystal in vacuum, but then the cleave the, the but then it's hard to get a 10 by 10 uh, millimeter spot. So if you cleave your crystal, uh, there will be terraces. It will not be perfectly smooth. Uh, and then some people say, oh, well, uh, cleaning metals is really, really easy. All I have to do is expose it to a high energy argon plasma and that will sputter away uh, what is on the surface. Uh, that's not true. You don't sputter it away, you, sput you push it into the surface. Uh, maybe you remove some of it, but others will just be uh, pushed into the surface. So that's like cleaning the dirt, pushing the dirt under the sofa. Uh, so the argon sputtering is not very effective. And, and uh, of course the argon sputtering will also amorphize the surface. So you may need to use several, uh, we, you may need to use several cycles of sputtering and annealing in order to get a clean surface. Uh, what we found when we developed nickel silicide contacts was that um, uh, sputtering with argon was completely ineffective from the 45 nanometer node and below, maybe even at 65 nanometers. Uh, sputtering was not a good way to clean silicon. So instead, what the best way that we found was that we first had a, a hydrofluoric acid dip and then you expose the wafer to a remote plasma where the, uh, you still have the plasma species, you still have the reactive species like fluorine and oxygen, especially fluorine. Uh, in the plasma, but you no longer have the high kinetic energy which amorphizes your sample. So um, for some projects we do, we spend more time cleaning the sample, cleaning the surface than uh, taking data or analyzing data. Uh, so your comment or your question about how sure can you be that your surface is clean uh, that is something that we ask ourselves all the time and that is a very important question that you should always ask. How can I be sure that my surface is clean? How can I prove this? And what 
estimates can I make and what simulations can I make to make corrections. Uh, what I haven't mentioned, what we haven't discussed is um, surface roughness. So there will always, uh, your surface will never be perfectly smooth, but there will always be atomic steps or maybe even uh, more than atomic steps. And uh, as well as you polish your platinum, you will never get it uh, absolutely smooth. And you see here that there is a difference between the solid line and this dash dotted line. And um, we believe that, um, so for every sample that we measure with ellipsometry, we also do atomic force microscopy. And uh, not so much for the infrared, but at least for the visible and the UV, because surface roughness, uh, the cleanliness of the surface becomes more and more important the further you go into the UV, because the wavelength gets smaller. So surface roughness or thin layers are especially important in the ultraviolet. And therefore, we do atomic force microscopy for almost every sample, and then we know the RMS roughness and then we can do this correction for surface roughness in order to take into account the surface effects. Uh, and uh, Carola has done a lot of work with germanium, and of course there uh, you also have a native oxide. And then uh, what you measure when you, when you measure the reflectance or the ellipsometry spectra for germanium, you need to know how thick is the, refract how thick is the uh, native oxide which sits on top. And there are ways that we can measure this. And then you need to do a correction of your data for that uh, thin surface layer that's on top. So cleanliness of the surface is very important. You can never do it 100%. And then it is better to correct your data to take into account the effects of that surface layer. Does, does that help? Okay, one more question. If not, then thank you very much. I probably did not even get through uh, half the material that I wanted to show, uh, but that is very good because it means that I do not have to prepare my next lecture over Easter. Uh, so I hope to see you again after Easter. And then either we get through the rest of the slides or we don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I think uh, I like it that you're asking more questions and uh, then we can have more of a discussion about that. So thank you very much.